I hope you can see my presentation now. Okay. So um, we will move on to something a little bit different, which is to talk about nanomaterials applications for immunotherapy. Uh, as Sheila kindly introduced me in the beginning, my name is Susanna Santos and I work in this beautiful building here in Porto named the I3S building. Oh. And my... And my interest is in studying the uh, biomaterials uh, capacity. Sorry, I'm, I'm hesitating because I have the bar on top of my slides and I can't see what I'm talking about. So here we go. Uh, about how biomaterials properties influence the immune response and why this is important. And we know and we've heard so much uh, beautiful and detailed work about characteristic of uh, particularly carbon-based materials in this uh, workshop. But for all materials, their composition, their size, their shape, their surface properties obviously impact the immune response. Wow, there we go. Uh, also, the protein corona that they acquire once they are implanted has a huge impact on that response. And that can go from complement activation to antibody recognition, intake by innate immune cells, and their capacity to stimulate uh, an adaptive response and activate, for example, T lymphocytes, their migration to lymph nodes, and um, consequences for antigen presentation. This, oh, sorry. This also has consequences for the circulation time sometimes of these particles, because if they are internalized by these cells in circulation, there you have less of them, or drug availability and even organ accumulation. And why is this important? Well, uh, our immune system will condition a lot of the responses that we have uh, in our body up once we implant the material. And sometimes we want it more towards immunity. If for, if for example, I am really sorry, this is um, putting other things in front. If, uh, for example, we want to fight cancer or pathogens, we want to promote inflammation and an immune response, or we may want to promote tolerance by uh, when we need to fight, for example, uh, autoimmunity. And on carbon materials, they are starting to be explored uh, for their impact on immune cells and for uh, modifying them in a way that they can uh, condition this immune response, either by absorbing uh, drugs or antibodies or peptides to these materials. They can be tailored to activate uh, cells of the immune system um, to, towards an inflammatory response, as I was saying, to fight tumors, for example, or as vaccines, or uh, towards an immunosuppressive response when we need to fight more autoimmunity. In a bit more detail, for example, in immunostimulation, carbon materials alone or in combination, for example, with phototherapy can be, or radiotherapy, I'm sorry, can be used to activate, for example, the reactive oxygen species production and immune cells. They can also be functionalized with different drugs to activate these cells. They lead to the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, activation, for example, of B cells that can produce antibodies uh, to fight virus, for example, that we've heard so much about in, this, in these last uh, couple of years with COVID, um, so to eliminate any kind of pathogen or cancer cells, for example. On the immunosuppression side, some of these materials can be um, scavengers for these reactive oxygen species, and they will then reduce their levels and will reduce the activation of immune cells. And of course, they can also be uh, combined with drugs that are uh, instead of stimulator inhibitors of these cells, leading to a shift from inflammatory cytokines to uh, anti-inflammatory cytokines and, for example, being used for treatment of asthma or allergies, uh, disorders where the immune response is overactivated. And as examples of this, so it's not too abstract, you can see here, for example, the um, carbon nanotubes that were used, multi-wall carbon nanotubes, internalized by a monocyte macrophage here inside the cell. The, the authors looked at the viability of the cells. This is really important because there's a phenomenon called immunotoxicity that is very prevalent with some nanomaterials and it's very important that we keep an eye on that because if you have immunotoxicity, then you have the immune cells will die and they will cause stress on other immune cells and aggravate your, your inflammatory response. And what the author saw so was that uh, the viability was maintained, that the material per se was not activating, for example, TNF-alpha secretion, which is a central pro-inflammatory cytokine, but when exposed together with LPS, which is a bacterial wall component, so simulating an infection, you had a, a combined effect of increasing the, the production of this important uh, cytokine. 
And also the authors looked at the stimulation of several of these pathways called tall like receptor pathways that activate immune cells in slightly different ways for outcomes of case virus or bacteria or yeast, for example. And what they saw was that the carbon nanotubes had the potential to sometimes increase the secretion of these cytokines that are inflammatory mediators and sometimes also decrease that uh, same production. Like for example, here with the IL-12, IL-23 and the TLR-5 agonists. So this is stimulated with different TLR agonists able to, to stimulate each one of these molecules. Also with uh, graphene nanosheets and other authors have shown their internalization again, and this is quite uh, interesting and a phenomenon that we've been looking at as well in the lab, which is they, they internalize and what, where do they go inside the cell? And here they show that they form these autophagic vehicles. So they activate the autophagic pathways in the cells. And of course that is dependent on the concentration. The more you have, the bigger these vacuoles are and the more numerous. And to cut a very long story short, they show that they activated TLR4, which is one of those pathways that starts at the cell surface and can, can go through a cascade of signaling molecules that are very common in these pathways, like MyD88 and then FKB, that trigger the production of inflammatory cytokines, but they also went through this autophagy uh, pathway. It also activated an intern, internal TLR, so something that exists inside the cell once the material is internalized, which ended up with similar pathways that to TLR4. Uh, just a, an example of immunosuppression. In this case, uh, the impact on lung inflammation in an in allergy model of this NC stabilizing fluorine derivative that you can see here, the structure. And what they did is a very common model of um, antigen triggered. Um, allergic reaction. So uh, this antigen, there is a model antigen called ovalbumin, is injected into the animals and then is the animals are challenged and you look at the allergic response. And in the meantime, they've given them this treatment with this T TGA. And what they see is that treatment reduces innate cell infiltration. So using eosinophils that you see here, it reduces cytokines that are very important in this allergic response, like IL-4 and IL-5. And it also has consequences for the tissue architecture itself that you see here. This is normal on the, on the right. You see in the middle, the treated one and the untreated, you see the architecture is different and there's a huge immune cell infiltrate as well. These materials are being used in many areas of uh, regenerative medicine as well. And one that I'm particularly keen on is bone tissue regeneration. And you see here this very interesting review from 2020. They showed how much these papers have been increasing in the last few years. And you see here after, after 2000, the increase of papers related to bone regeneration in some way from the cells uh, differentiation to the actual bone tissue engineering, taking uh, advantage of the uh, incredible properties of some of these materials from the 0D to the 3D uh, structures. In my lab work, so the, the work with carbon materials is only starting, so I will give you an example of something that we've done in the past with nanoparticles, in this case uh, lipid uh, carriers, nanostructured lipid carriers, uh, I'm sorry, and what we did with them was we use them for, for several things. And we use them, for example, uh, loaded with FITSI, which is a fluorophore that you can see uh, under a fluorescence microscope, for example. And we use this beautiful technique that is called imaging flow cytometry that allows you to see the cells here that you see in bright field, the nanoparticles. This is a cell surface marker, which together allows us to see if the particles are inside the cell. And also we label the nuclei and so here you can see the nanoparticles inside the cell. This is just granularity of these cells. This is an interesting parameter for us to study uh, the cell's biology. Um, but here you can see both of the particles are inside the cell, but also, and quite importantly, in terms of toxicity, that the nuclei are uh, intact. So we don't have nuclear fragmentation or, or cells bulging um, from the internalization of those materials. And this technique also allows us to quantify how many cells have these particles internalized. And what we could see is that this depends, of course, in the material concentration. So the more concentration, the more cells you see here within this orange area quantified in, in the graph below. Um, that have the particles internalized, but also, and quite importantly, it depends on the activation status of the cell. So in the bottom line, you have cells that were exposed 
previously to an inflammatory condition. So if you think of a particle to encapsulate a drug that is anti-inflammatory, which is my uh, particular interest, then you have to make sure that it will be internalized by the cells, even in inflammatory conditions. And what we were looking at was the impact of those conditions on the nanoparticle internalization. So then we proceeded to load those particles with our anti-inflammatory drug of choice, which was resveratrol in this case, and looked at the expression of different activation markers by, flow, by conventional now flow cytometry, which allows us to look at these markers simultaneously. And when we uh, quantify this across several primary uh, donors of cells, of these dendritic cells, we can see that the presence of these particles and with the increasing concentration of the drug in the particles, we have a decrease of these activation markers. So the drug is functional inside our nanoparticles. And in fact, I think it's not here, but it's more uh, effective than the drug uh, alone because the drug is not very highly soluble and it probably gets lost very quickly. We looked also at important parameters for us in terms of cell activation, like signaling pathway activation. And here you see a, a member of the NFKB family that we saw earlier as related to cytokine secretion. And we see less activation when we have the presence of the nanoparticles, like this little band here that you see here, when, without the particles and with the particles. And compared even with the free drug here, uh, you see that the, in the nanoparticles, we have uh, much higher inhibition. And when we look at the consequences of this in terms of pro-inflammatory cytokine secretion, we see a reduction of these uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines here with the nanoparticles with five micromolar is enough to have a significant reduction. While it, the drug is free, you need to have twice that amount. So cutting a, a, a long story short, we can use these particles to, to label cells, for example, when we load them with a, a fluorescent marker or to uh, interfere with their activation and the consequences of that activation. As I said, the work with uh, carbon materials is only starting in collaboration with uh, Artur Pinto. And um, some of the things that we are doing is looking at how those materials can condition the activation, in this case of dendritic cells, which can then uh, activate an adaptive immune response. And we can measure that by looking at T cell proliferation. So we label T cells in the beginning, we put them in contact with the cells that have been stimulated with the materials and we look at proliferation. Why? Because when T cells are stimulated specifically, they proliferate is one of their first responses. If they are cytotoxic, they proliferate to go to the local to be able to eliminate the virus or the pathogen. Or if they are T helpers, they will be doing their job, for example, stimulating B cells. And this is ongoing work at the moment. It remains for me to thank the people that have been, have been working with for all this time inside I3S, uh, also now this, this recent collaboration with Artur and his team at uh, the Faculty of Engineering. The hospital is uh, an, a very precious collaboration of ours, some external collaborators and the funding sources. And I will pass you on to uh, Maria José uh, so that we can proceed with the, the presentation. I will stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Susanna. I'm just trying to look for the... Yes, so thank you very much. So meanwhile, I would first acknowledge Sheila for this uh, very nice introduction. Of course, uh, acknowledge Janan and uh, also to Artur for this uh, kind invitation to be here and for being part of such a great project. And uh, uh, to acknowledge also Susanna for the easy task she provided me she, since she already introduced all part of this immunology uh, uh, story and what we are particularly interested. So I, I'm sharing with you now the screen. I hope you can see it. And and we are uh, at this moment so uh, looking on uh, nanomaterials for uh, immunotherapy but in this as, as uh, Susanna mentioned in our case we are particularly interested on using them for cancer targeting and to counterbalance uh, cancer progression so I will very briefly tell you that in my group at I3S we are very much interested on something we call the tumor microenvironment so that means that the tumor is not only formed by 
by cancer cells that are here signed in blue, but they are also comprised by many other components, extracellular components here in yellow, but also other cellular components like uh, bone marrow derived cells, endothelial cells, fibroblasts, but many immune cells that are co uh, cohabiting with the cancer cells at this local primary or, at or also at metastatic tumors. And that they are very important because they are being modulated by the cancer cells, but they are also modulating cancer cell activity. And from this crosstalk, tumor may escape the immune control and the tumor may progress and then, of course, affecting uh, the, the, the cancer, uh, the metastasis and also the survival of the patient. So it is very important for us to understand the crosstalk and the way our immune cells and cancer cells in particular are interacting. And from the immune cells, we are particularly focused on a population that are the macrophages population here signed, and we want to understand how the crosstalks are established to develop novel therapies to modulate this macrophage cancer cell crosstalk. And very briefly, I will tell you why macrophages, because this is an immune cell population that is, as actually the immune populations that Suzanne explained to you, very plastic. And this plasticity may dictate the success of the, the way they interact with the cancer cells and the, how cancer cells may then escape. And as you probably know, we do not have macrophages in circulation. We do have monocytes. And when they are uh, reached to a tissue, according to the type of factors that they find at this tissue, they might differentiate into two major profiles, a kind of more pro-inflammatory, also known as M1-like, and an anti-inflammatory, also known as M2-like. And I'm sorry for this molecular background, but this is important that you can then understand the rest of the presentation. And in fact, what is known is that these pro-inflammatory macrophages that are normally the, the differentiated upon exposure to bacterial, viral, or, or even some pathogen elements, they are then becoming very aggressive. These are macrophages that are pro-inflammatory. They secrete inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha, IL-1-beta, il and they are then recruited to this site of a tumor, specifically attacking populations and other soldiers that will combat together with macrophages the tumor. And if this occurs in a good way, tumor cells are eliminated. But we know that frequently tumors arise because the tumor cells escape to this immune control and the cells develop, cancer cells develop mechanisms to escape to this surveillance. And so one of the mechanisms described is that the conditions in the tumor might differentiate macrophages, not to this pro-inflammatory population, but instead to an anti-inflammatory population. And this anti-inflammatory population is not producing pro-inflammatory molecules as this one, but instead is producing IL-10, TGF-beta, that are immune suppressive molecules that are sustaining still the differentiation into a continuous anti-inflammatory profile. These macrophages are not asking or recruiting this type of populations. Instead, they are recruiting a type of populations that are more immune suppressive, like T regulatory cells, myeloid derived suppressor cells, that once they arrive to the tumor, they are not battling the cancer cells, they are instead sometimes participating in many functions because they secrete angiogenic factors, so they promote angiogenesis, which brings new fuel to the tumors, new oxygen, new nutrients, but at the same time they produce factors that might promote the migration of cancer cells, their ability to cross the membrane and to invade and metastasize. And so it's very important for us to understand how macrophages might balance these uh, pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory in a tumor context and to develop therapies that could help to battle tumors or to help the immune system to battle tumors. So then we came to this project and this idea in collaboration with the group of Professor Mario Barbosa at I3S, in particular with Susanna Sands and also with Raquel Gonçalves. 
and idea because I'm not from a biomaterial area person. Instead, I'm an oncologist learning to be immunologist. So I'm at the tumor immunology field. I have to learn from my colleague engineers how these challenges, how can I indeed battle tumors in a better way? And what we knew from our biology point of view and from patient samples were that the macrophages that we find in tumors, in particular in colon and breast tumors, these macrophages are frequently dormant, are immune suppressive. And what we wanted is to develop based on nanoparticles to turn these immune suppressive Neurogenic immune cells into immune stimulatory. So we want to awake these macrophages, we want to awake these dendritic cells, and to make them able to recognize and to eliminate tumors. So at that time, uh, they, uh, the group of Somari Barbosa, they were also producing with other purpose uh, in these uh, nanoparticles of chitosan and polyglutamic acid. And we decided to try, since these uh, nanoparticles were composed by these two major elements that are indeed on it their own pro-inflammatory, we decided that maybe joining these two polymers and uh, joining chitosan with polyglutamic acid into nanoparticles, this could have a pro-inflammatory role them by themselves on, on uh, immune cells. So in fact, as you know, chitosan is derived from the exoskeleton of crustacea and it has a positive charge and the polyglutamic acid is derived from bacillus uh, species uh, wall and it really has a negative charge. These molecules, when joined together through a conservation method, they form nanoparticles. These nanoparticles, as you can appreciate here, are of about 118 nanometers. And what we observe is that once we introduce these nanoparticles to macrophages and also to dendritic cells, these nanoparticles were internalized, as you can visualize here in confocal microscopy. And also here in a flow cytometry, we could visualize that about 98% of these nanoparticles were internalized. So then to try to make a long, a long story shorter, I try to illustrate here what we could achieve in vitro with these nanoparticles. And so the principle was to provide these nanoparticles to dormant immune cells, in particular to inactive uh, dendritic cells and to anti-inflammatory macrophages, those that are supposedly more uh, helper to the tumor to grow and to progress. So what we have seen is that when we expose these uh, inactive dendritic cells and immature dendritic cells to nanoparticles, we started to observe a gain of pro-inflammatory markers. So they start to have on their surface co-stimulatory receptors that are helping the T cell activation. But at the same time, they start to express more MHC class II molecules that are important to present antigen to the T cells. Concomitant to that, we saw that these dendritic cells start to express a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines as IL-6, TNF, and IL-12. And we observed that these dendritic cells that were immature and exposed to these nanoparticles were then activated and they were able to induce particularly the activation and proliferation of a specific population of T cells that are CD4 T cells, leading to the production of interferon gamma, identifying that these are becoming, in fact, active cells. When we provided these nanoparticles to macrophages in opposite, we could see that these anti-inflammatory macrophages were a losing uh, important uh, scavenger receptor, a marker of anti-inflammatory, but they were not altering their antigen presentation capacity. Instead, they were also producing IL-10, but producing still a high amount of pro-inflammatory cytokines, and they were able to induce particularly the proliferation of a specific CD3 population that are CD8 T cells, that are the cytotoxic T cells, and producing interferon gamma. The more interesting that we have seen was that in vitro, when we exposed cancer cells to these nanoparticle-educated let's say like that, dendritic cells, or to these nanoparticle educated macrophages, we observed that we could counteract macro cancer cell invasion. 
So this in vitro showed us that these nanoparticles seem to be very good. They are indeed pro-inflammatory in vitro. They can activate these inflammatory cells that are more dormant into a proactive inflammatory state, leading to the proliferation of CD3 cells. But at the same time, they were impairing cancer cell invasion. And this for us was a very interesting point. We wanted then to validate how the relevance is it is in vivo. And therefore, we needed to use uh, immune competent animals because, as you may know, the majority of the experiments that are performed on mice frequently have human cells. And for that, these mice have to be immune deficient. Otherwise, they will not form tumors. So we needed to have a formation of tumors in an immune competent background that we could evaluate the impact of the immune system. So in this case, we could not use human cells. Of course, we needed to use mice-derived breast cancer cells. And what we have was introduced these breast cancer cells in the mammary fat pad of the mice. And we had decided to combine these nanoparticles with radiotherapy. Why that? Because we knew previously that radiotherapy has a very good pro-inflammatory effect also. We know that radiotherapy might kill cancer cells efficiently, but frequently tumors that have been irradiated, they start to relapse and to reawake some, some years after. So we wanted to use this good effect of radiotherapy and potentiate its good effect with these pro-inflammatory nanoparticles to evaluate wait whether we could improve even radiotherapy effect. And therefore, we had done this collaboration together with colleagues at TMEM in uh, Lisbon, but also in the University of Ghent, where I did my PhD, because they have a special small animal radiation research platform that allow us to mimic in a mice what normally a patient does during a radiotherapy session. So what we have done in our animals, we have implanted, as I told you, in the mammary gland, uh, we have implanted these uh, very aggressive uh, cancer cells. We allow them to develop a tumor until 28 days when we need to sacrifice the mice because at this point they develop a, a aggressive lung metastasis and they end up to die if we would not sacrifice at this time point. And then we had provided to the tumor harboring mice, these nanoparticles. We had uh, just provided radiotherapy to mimic a week of irradiation of a cancer patient. And in this situation, we decided to do two sessions of five gray because normally during a week, a patient receives 10 gray. So we decided to divide it in these two sessions. And we have then combined radiotherapy together with nanoparticles. I just wanted to show you that this is actually the SARP system that we have used. So this is exactly a linear accelerator as a cancer patient has to be exposed. You have here what is the bed. You have here the linear accelerator that is oscillating to irradiate with precision the mice tumor. So this is really precise for the, my, the, the, the tumor area, saving all and sparing all the normal tissue around as it is performed on a cancer patient. So afterwards, as you can see, these are the different treatments, and I just show you to, to, to evidence that the animals were surviving well along these four weeks. They were surviving well and still gaining weight a long time, and it was no difference between the controls and the treated animals regarding this, and that we could also not see neither signs of kidney or liver toxicity given to the nanoparticles administration or the combination of nanoparticles with radiotherapy. We then look to the primary tumor growth. And here I would like to show you that in black, you can see the animals that have not been treated. So they have harbored tumors and the tumor is growing over time. You can see in blue the impact after the administration of nanoparticles on primary tumor growth. In gray, after radiotherapy, you see that there is a slight decrease on the slope of the curve. But when we combine radiotherapy with nanoparticles in red, you see that there is in fact, a significant decrease of primary tumor growth. 
we then look to the mice and this as you can see these mice have been safely maintained because we we did not sacrifice the mice along the time points these cells were luciferase positive so we could follow the animals in vivo to minimize the sacrifice of the animals and what you see is that the animal needs to be um, an anesthetized for the radiotherapy sessions and at the same time we are visualizing and monitoring the, the, the primary tumor and the as you can see here, there are clear differences on the fluoros the, the, sorry, the luciferase and bioluminescence labeled of the primary tumor with the nanoparticles that is considerable with the radiotherapy smaller than in the control condition, as you can see here, and as you observed also here. So afterwards, we decided to look also to the spleen and these animals, because these animals normally happen in radiation. They, I'm sorry, happen the administration of the cancer cells. The spleen of these mice are very enlarged. They develop splenomegaly, like frequently these breast cancer patients also do. This is a model of triple negative breast cancer. And this is a sign of systematic disease. And what you can see is that, in fact, happen the, the administration of radiotherapy together with nanoparticles, the spleen size tends to normalize and to decrease considerable compared with the control. And also histologically, you can start to see the white and red pulp areas of these uh, tissues. Mm -hmm. We then looked uh, carefully to the populations that are present, and we looked particularly to the, the, the spleen. And what we can see indeed, this reduction of splenomegaly is accompanied by alterations on immune cells. In particular, we see a decrease of uh, the myeloid cells in comparison to the controls. And what is very interesting is that we see particularly an increase of neutrophils and an increase also of macrophages. So suggesting that in this administration of the nanoparticles com uh, compared to the nanoparticles alone or radiotherapy alone, the joint administration seems to increase the number of this type of populations at the spleen at the same time that the primary tumor is being reduced. We then look to the lymphoid populations at the spleen, and regarding that, we have seen no differences regarding T regulatory cells. We see no differences regarding the cytotoxic T cells. We just see that the CD4 helper cells expressing interferon gamma are indeed also being increased together with these alterations on the myeloid populations. At last, we then decided to look systemically at this, uh, the plasma uh, and the blood of these animals. And we observed that the combined administration of radiotherapy with the nanoparticles reduced considerable the amount of some cytokines, in particularly IL-3, IL-4, IL-6, and IL-10, and uh, affected the, the expression of interferon gamma. We, at last of all, decided to look also to the metastasis. And in this triple negative breast cancer model, there are frequently metastasis developing the lungs. And as you can see, we can have different scores of metastasis, one where there are no metastasis, another where some cancer cells, breast cancer cells, appear between the alveol in the, in the, in the lung. Other conditions that we have a score three where we have a considerable metastasis and the score four, where many of these animals are filled with metastasis. What we could observe is that uh, in comparison to controls, where we can mainly observe metastatic characteristics of score three and four, meaning a lot of cancer cells in the lungs, in the combination of radiotherapy with nanoparticles, we see a considerable decrease of this profile, and we have mainly no metastasis at all, or very small metastasis being formed in the lung, as it is the score one and two. So this was the end of my presentation. And I hope to uh, explain you and that it's a kind of the continuation of what Suzanne mentioned, using the nanomaterials for immunotherapy. We are tr trying with these nanoparticles to in fact awake the immune cells. And the way we have uh, really used in this way, these pro-inflammatory molecules, they revealed to be important, at least in a breast cancer triple negative model, to be very efficient in the reducing the primary tumor growth, in reorganizing the 
spleen populations, recruiting many neutrophils and also changing systemically the inflammatory cytokines and reducing the metastasis at the lung. I would like to finalize to acknowledge all the colleagues and people in my group at I3S, but also other colleagues at I3S, uh, in particular from the group of Professor Mario Barbosa, Raquel and Susanna, that helped me and collaborate a lot in this work. It's really a pleasure to have also Artur now as a collaborator in, uh, in our group and to help us in developing these challenges. And of course, our international collaborators. And to end up, if Sheila allows me, I just would like, together with Susanna, to present you uh, uh, to uh, uh, here uh, just a slide to advertise actually to uh, uh, courses that we are uh, engaged to that are particular occurring this year. So from the 21 to the 23 of June in Porto. The first is a summer course of two days from 21 to 22 of June on fibrosis from mechanics to the clinic, to, from the mechanisms to the clinic we would like to highlight. And the other is a symposium on immunomodulation in cancer and regeneration that is taking fibrosis also as a challenge. These are occurring in Porto. They are occurring at I3S. Porto is a very nice city at this period of the year. So we strongly invite you to come and to, uh, to hear more about uh, this. You will have great talkers. So that's our promise. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sheila. Sorry for this time. <laughs>